I didn't you have polio somewhere? I had polio when I was four. So let's wait a minute. Let's just let's just go back to that. Okay, it's a good thing I know you. <laughs> okay, so when you had when you had polio, my spine was paralyzed for two months, and my mother fought. This was in forty six. Forty seven. You did. You did have the vaccine. They didn't have a vaccine in forty six. Oh, That's didn't? when the big polio epidemics were, uh-huh. and. That was one of the things my mother was guilty about because I apparently cried that night and she just, she was Dr. Spock in those days where... Leave the kid crying. Right, and then I, was, I couldn't move the next day. And she begged the doctor to leave me at home and let her take care of me and quarantine us because you had to go into quarantine in a hospital. He almost lost his license over this because one of her friends eventually turned into the health organization that I had polio. But by then I was well enough. But he almost lost his license. Another thing, I almost died so many times, I think three times my first year. And he, the doctor, Dr. Martin, told my mother he would adopt me. She said, no way. (laughs) But I was such a health hazard. Wow. So with the polio, you were paralyzed for two months? And so, and then what happened? I... I uh, I merged so well that later, this was in Miami, she took me to Rusk Institute to yeah. have me evaluated. They could not believe the level of my paralysis because when they took children, I would have died, first of all, and they isolated them, they died. From the isolation, probably. Mm-hmm. And she just kept whatever, she, her care of me was what it took that no one could believe until I had the post-polio collapse in my 50s. Right, okay, so take us back. So what kind of care, because I think, again, these influences of these impossible acrobats and flying Willendas and all that business, and uh, uh, the, it, the insurmountable odds of, of overcoming polio. So what kind of, what did your mother actually do? I don't remember. She gave it chicken soup. I mean, I mean, you know, she, whatever she, whatever she, she did. She devoted you know. her life to that, I'm Wow. Sure. And so how and did that recovery, moment, did, was it by degrees? I mean, that you suddenly, no memory. you don't remember. I do remember, what I remember is there was a sign on the door. It was under quarantine and that I would look out the door at my friends. Oh. And I was not allowed to go out. I don't remember wow. um, how or why. Wow. But I do know I owe her that I survived that. Boy, your mother was something. How old was she when she passed? She was in her mid-60s. She took her life. She, your mom took her life? Do you want to talk? No. Okay. That was also eventually a gift, but at the moment it wasn't. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'm telling so, you, the world was not so neat. Whoever thought it was. I mean, right. no. I mean, you know, neat lives. You see, this is another point for this, uh, for this archival footage, is that neat lives do not lead to pioneering spirits. I don't think so. I think that, they, that there's a succumbing to comfort that, do, that ha- does not ignite a... The 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 enor- the enormous push. See, I think that's what it is. Is that there's this push to to normalize. Well, to even be present, however that is. That that is the gift in itself. Oh, then I mean the. You're right. How to how to meet life, where I think so many so many advices that we're giving are how to normalize life. Right, and I, I actually don't feel that way. Yeah. I feel that the, I mean, it's tricky territory, but I feel that, you know, if you look at people who become contributors, they're not people that had comfortable lives. They're really not. They're people who had a fire in the belly somehow, so that the, you know. Okay, so when we look at Bonnie Bain, Bainbridge Cohn, uh, she didn't drop from the sky. So there were these influences, you know, as you're shaping the character of the Bonnie as 
she began to emerge. So when you went to occupational therapy, then you, did you actually work as an occupational therapist? I still do. You still do. And so, so when did the, um, how did that go when you began to go into the whole anatomical uh, wanting to elaborate the mapping and all? I mean, how did that, I mean, this is so critical, it seems. Like, how did that happen? Do you? Okay. Um, I'll weave a couple of things. I got a uh, National Foundation scholarship to go to university, and I went to Ohio State University to study occupational therapy. But meanwhile, I really wanted to dance. I mean, the dance was how I expressed myself. So while it had the discipline had all these other lineages, it was a means of expression. Sure. While I was at Ohio State, I also took dance. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I'll, I'll jump again. When I graduated, I went to work there at the Ohio State University Rehab Center. So I'm mm -hmm. going to go back a little bit during my internship. Mm -hmm. I did a children's, uh, an internship at a children's hospital in Indianapolis, I think between my junior and senior year, I'm not sure, around 1962. And there was a playroom. Mm -hmm. So we did our therapy in the playroom and there was a child up on the ward who had a tracheotomy. Mm -hmm and he couldn't come down to the playroom, so I used to go up to be with him there. And so I asked a nurse up there, I saw her doing a cleaning out the trach, suctioning it, so I said, um, if I learn to do that, can I take him downstairs to the playroom? Mm. So the nurse showed me how to suction the tracheotomy. So then I talked to the woman in the OT department, and he could come downstairs, which meant then they had to learn how to do the tracheotomy mm. so that he could come down. How old was he? Do you remember? Mm. Four, five, mm. six, something like that. Mm. So one of the things that he taught me was how the lung, how the bronchi, like how you have to get the tube down each of the, into the different areas of the lung. Lobes of the lung. So he, he was a teacher. The little boy. The little boy. And then when I did my last internship, it was supposed to be the last one, was in Cleveland. They ended up discharging me or failing me or whatever. They, sent, they told me I couldn't stay because I was dangerous. What was to be my last internship took place at a rehab center in Cleveland, Ohio. It was, at that point, one of the top rehab centers in the world. But after I was there a month, they dismissed me as being dangerous as an occupational therapy intern. I don't know if they ever dismissed anyone else before. So you, you, were, you, have, I, a, I, I, you have an honor. I have an honor there. <laughs> and it's interesting because I would do the same decisions today that I did then, but I was too young to make them. And um, one of them, I have to go back, and that I had done an internship as a younger student, um, like once or twice a week, going into the tuberculosis hospital at the university and being with the people there. And I had not been exposed to tuberculosis. I was negative on those tests. Mm. Um, anyway, so I knew that it wasn't that contagious. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did in the internship, the more advanced one, was we went on rounds with the doctors and they told us whatever we were supposed to know. So there was a patient there and on the door they had tuberculosis. So it said, don't go in without robes and masks and everything. But the doctors went in, everybody else stayed out. So I walked in with the doctors, sans mask and everything. I wanted to know what they were going to do. What who the patient was. So anyway, that was one way I was dangerous mm. because you were. I didn't stay in the 
troop outside the door. Right. I went in with the doctors as peon. I didn't even think about it. I wanted to, I just went in. And I knew it wasn't dangerous. Another one was a man who had had a stroke, severe stroke. So he couldn't use this arm at all. It was in a sling. It was actually quite flaccid. And so they, what they did in those days, and maybe they still do today, I hope not, but perhaps they still do, they just put it in a sling so he wouldn't sublux. And he was a businessman, very bright and devastated by this stroke. And it so happened that his physical therapist was a co-student of mine, but she was older, so she had graduated. And in those days, and again, I hope it's only those days, but I suspect it's true still in some places, patients were cut at the waist and physical therapists took care of the legs, occupational therapists took care of the hands and arms. Mm. Uh, so one of the things was he obviously wanted someone to work with this arm, so I took it out of the sling. And when I held it, it felt like it could have been a piece of meat. I had not a clue what I was holding. And I was devastatedly stunned. And in my nature, I said, I made a vow. I would someday know what I was holding in my hand. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, the occupational therapist, who was my supervisor, said I was giving him false hope by taking his arm out of the sling and not teaching him how to be one-handed. Oh, God, the medical mafia rides again. I mean, and, just... And so I didn't really listen to her, you see, if no one was around. <laughs> anyway, so then one day he was getting going to be discharged, and this person whom I thought was a friend, not an acquaintance friend anyway, I'm still not sure what happened there, um, the man's wife was there, we were discharging, we were being discharged, meeting with her um, before he left, and he was to walk across the room. Well, I was standing next to his wheelchair, I was an attractive young woman, and he reached for my arm and I gave it to him. And we walked across the room. I had usurped her role. It was her job to walk him across the room. And she would have done it by letting him struggle with a yeah, tri, what do you call it, tricane yeah. thing. I think there were probably other things, but they, they let me go. Oh. So I was two months from graduating. Ooh. And I told uh, the I told my um, professor, you know, this is it. And meanwhile, they immediately went to bat for me. And there was a new rehab center at the university who was going to take a student, their first student, in a few months. And they upped it, and they took me instead. And they didn't mind that you had been uh, a troublemaker. The first week I was there, they all left and went to a conference and left me in control of the department. That was the difference between these two situations. Oh my God. And so I ended up working there a couple of years after I graduated. But the difference between this new department and these wonderfully creative, wonderful women and this other place that was just so repressive and so um, oh, uncreative. Okay, so how did, what was the, uh, so, okay, so then how did the glimmering of your determination, you know, how did that happen? You know, here you are, you're kind of rebellious. You're but quiet, you see. Nobody knew I was rebellious so much. Oh, you were a quiet <laughs> rebel. Okay, you were not demonstrating in the streets no. and stuff like that. No. Okay, so the, okay, so how did that happen? You know, like I remember years ago at Esalen, you know, you had said that you were determined to change the map of the whole physiology and how we saw it. So, how, how, and, and you know, I've been very struck with your karma and your destiny, really. So, how did that begin to happen? 